Good morning. And welcome to worship at the Hopewell Reformed Church. If you're visiting with us this morning, we have a gift for you at the kiosk in the uh, Fellowship Hall. Please stand and join me in the call to worship. This is the day which the Lord has made. This is the house which the Lord has built. This is the fellowship of believers to which God has called us. This is the renewing of our hearts and minds through worship. The hymn is Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, hymn 135. The call of God upon our lives can be like a voice in the night. It can be like a quiet song in our hearts. It can be like a thundering sound of whirlwind. Whatever it is, God calls us to seek and serve him. In order to be prepared for whatever God calls us to, we must be right in the right relationship with him. We do that by confessing whatever obstacles may be in our way. Please pray this prayer of confession with me in unison. Father, we want to follow you. We want to obey you. We want to be ready to hear your voice, quiet and still as through your written word, or loud and insistent through your spirit. Take away anything that stands in the way. Make us always aware of your speaking. Forgive us when we are reluctant to obey. Shape us and use us. Amen. And now hear these words of assurance. God can use his word, a song, a friend, or a sermon to touch our hearts and bring us closer to him. Whatever way he chooses, he is ready to meet us when we take that first step towards him. Believe this and live expectantly. And now please stand and greet each other with the passing of the peace of Christ.
Please be seated. So we've been walking on the way to Bethlehem, and this is the time for the children's message and the lighting of the Advent wreath. And as we walk to Bethlehem, <clears throat> we remember the prophets. The prophet Isaiah told us that the Messiah would come, that light would shine in the darkness, and the darkness will never overcome it. And who else will show us the way? That's your cue. Go ahead. You guys are good. <laughs> yeah. We also heard that Mary and Joseph are on their way to Bethlehem. They have a secret. An angel came to them and said, Do not be afraid. Be joyful. You will have God's special son. You will name him Jesus. This is the light of the Holy Family. It reminds us not to be afraid, but to be joyful on the way to You don't have to be scared. <laughs> I'm friendly. You want to? You want to? Okay, we can just uh, climb up on this step. There we go. Good. I know you like the first two candles, the first two purple candles. like the pink candle. The candle of the shepherds. Good. Now a couple of questions. How do you think the shepherds felt when the angel appeared to them? And anyone can answer this. How do you think they felt when the angel appeared to them? Scared. Frightened, scared, yeah. This is what it says in the Bible. It's very they were frightened, they were afraid. The angels always have to say, do not be afraid. And do you think they found the baby Jesus as they walked to Bethlehem? What do you think? Any ideas? Somebody whispered yes. Rich, yes. Thank you. I was, I was getting nervous for a minute. I was thinking, this congregation, we need to teach that story again. No. Um, and what do you think, do you think they were full of joy? What, what do you think they felt when they found the baby Jesus? Joy. I didn't mean to give you a leading question. <laughs> joy, they probably felt joy. Yes, let's say a prayer. God, we give you thanks that we are all on the way to Bethlehem during this Advent season, <clears throat> on the way to meet the baby Jesus. And we pray that Jesus would be born again in our hearts, born again in us this Christmas season. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, and you can go to your Sunday school meetings. Thank you.
Amen. A few announcements this morning. We had a wonderful living nativity last night, so if you haven't driven through the nativity, please come tonight. Um, it starts at 4.30 and we'll go to 7 o'clock. So we had just a, a beautiful night. The weather held up last night, and uh, tonight's supposed to be even better weather, so we're looking forward to tonight's nativity. We'll have Christmas caroling on December 18th, so show up here at the church at 1 p.m. We'll be caroling to people who are homebound and also to nursing homes. Your contribution envelopes are in the fellowship hall, so you can pick those up on your way out. And our Christmas Eve services will be 4 p.m. for the uh, family service, 7.30 p.m. for the uh, traditional service with brass instruments and candle lighting, and the 11 p.m. service will be a, a praise and worship service with communion. Let us continue our service of worship with the giving and receiving of our tithes and offerings. Father, for the privilege of sharing in your ministry. 
Our individual gifts might not seem like much, but with your blessing, they will be multiplied like loaves and fish. Thank you for what you will do to enhance your kingdom through this place and through these people. Amen. Let us pray. God, you came to us in Christ. You became flesh, incarnate, living with us, feeling our pain. When the angels announced to the shepherds that a Savior was born, they sang glory to God in the highest heaven, peace on earth to those whom God favors. And so this morning, with the angels, we sing and we glorify your name. God, we're thankful for all that you have given to us, for your presence in this struggling world. We're thankful for our nation, for our community, and for the witness of your church worshiping around the world. But today we're especially grateful for the gift of your son who gave up his heavenly home for a manger on earth and a cross so that we might experience redemption a gift that never spoils or fades. And with the angels, we also desire peace on earth, a peace which is broader and deeper than we can imagine or bring about. <clears throat> we pray for the restoration of this world, for the growth of your kingdom, for reconciliation, for healing, and for renewal. And God, we bring you our prayers this morning, prayers for the nations. Especially this morning, we pray for all women in Afghanistan who are struggling under the rule of the Taliban. We remember the families of the victims of the truck accident in Mexico this week that killed so many people. And we remember the people of Ukraine as Russia gears for war. And God, we pray for our nation. Especially this morning, we remember in prayer all of the people in those communities across the nation that have been hit so hard by the tornadoes on Friday night. We pray for the people in Kentucky, Illinois, Arkansas, Tennessee, and Missouri. We pray for the family members and friends of all of those who died in the storms. God, we pray for your church around the world, for its mission, for those who minister. We remember in prayer this morning our missionaries, the Salehs, bless them, God, in their ministry with Wycliffe Bible Translators. And we remember our congregation, our family and faith here. We remember the churches in this class, and especially this morning, we hold up in prayer St. John's Reformed Church in Red Hook. They're having a service of installation for their new pastor this afternoon, Alicia Ritma. So we pray for St. John's. We pray for Alicia as she begins her new pastorate. We pray for all of those in our church family and in our own families who are in need of your healing. And God, we lift out and up names to you right now. Just call out the names of any you'd like to pray for. God, we pray this morning for Andy Loesch, that you'd strengthen him and give him courage to fight both his infection and his cancer. We pray for Eva's friend, Sue, who has stage four cancer. We pray for Vicki Gallagher's friend, Karen, who has stage four kidney cancer. We give thanks that Chris had um, positive tests this past week. We pray for Karen Nissel as she recovers at home after knee replacement surgery. We pray for Linda, who's waiting for a liver transplant. We pray for Dan, who is five weeks into treat treatment for his cancer. We pray for Gabby, who's eight years old and just had surgery this week to remove a tumor on her kidney. We pray, pray for uh, Claire and for her mother, Sharon who's in the hospital, that you give her healing and strength. Pray for Ginny Young, who's worshiping at home this morning. 
We pray for Steve and Jane Dambra at the passing of Steve's mother, Jill, that you'd pray that you'd comfort Steve and Jill and their whole family at the loss of his mother. And we pray for the family of Dylan who passed away, a young man who passed away this week. We pray for Jan Bushy's niece, Elizabeth, who lost her college-aged daughter, Cameron, this past week. Cameron was a student at Liberty University. She had a seizure and did not recover. We pray for Cameron's whole family and for Jan. <clears throat> we pray for Frida Sawyer and for her daughter, Amanda. Give thanks, God, that she is now home from the hospital and on the road to recovery. And God, we lift up before you all of our joys. Just call out, call out your joys to God. This morning, God, we also lift up to you thanksgiving for the birth of Connor Nieves, Nelson and Sue's new grandson who was born on Friday. God, you make your incarnate presence known in each situation. And may we, as your servants, be vessels of your peace. We pray this in the name of the one who became flesh and dwelt among us, Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we are bold to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The hymn is While, the Sh While by the Sheep, hymn 166. Let us pray. <clears throat> Holy God, as we open your word this morning, 
Show us who you are. Show us your character. You give us pictures of who we should be. You teach us about your plans for your people in days gone by and for us in this present time. So God, teach us now through your holy word. Amen. So during this Advent season, we've been preaching through the, uh, the birth stories in Scripture. And we started um, in the first Sunday in Advent with the birth story of Isaac. Then last week, we talked about the birth story of Moses. And this morning, we're going to read through the birth story of Samuel. And this is a fascinating story. There's so many interesting details in this story that teach us about our faith. So listen for God's holy word as we read through this story of the birth of Samuel. Hear the word of God as it is written for us in 1 Samuel chapter 1. Elkanah had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Now Elkanah used to go up year by year from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord at Shiloh. And on the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to his wife Penina and to all of her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. Hannah's rival, Penina, used to provoke her severely, to irritate her, because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb. So it went on year by year. As often as Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, Penina used to provoke her. Therefore Hannah wept and would not eat. Hannah's husband, Elkanah, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart sad? Am I not more valuable to you than ten sons? After they had eaten and drunk at Shiloh, Hannah rose and presented herself before the Lord. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. And Hannah was deeply distressed, and she prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she made this vow. She said, Lord of hosts, if you will only look on the misery of your servant and remember me. Do not forget your servant. But if you will give to your servant a male child, then I will set him before you as a Nazarite until the day of his death. And as Hannah continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying silently. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, How long will you make a drunken spectacle of yourself? Put away your wine. But Hannah answered, No, my Lord. I'm a woman deeply troubled. I've drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I've been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for I've been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation all this time. Then Eli answered, Go in peace. May the God of Israel grant you the petition that you've made to him. And she said, Let your servant find favor in your sight. Then Hannah went to her quarters. She ate and drank with her husband, and her countenance was sad no longer. In due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. She named him Samuel, for she said, I have asked him of the Lord. And when she had weaned him, she brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. And Hannah said to Eli, O oh my Lord, I am the woman who was standing here in the presence of the Lord, praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me the petition that I made to him. Therefore, I have given him over to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is given to the Lord. And she left him there for the Lord. 
Here ends the reading of God's word for us this morning. May God help us as we seek to understand these words. Hannah wanted more than anything else to have a baby. And when she had the baby, she gave him away, left him at the temple. She gave away what was most precious to her. This is a story about giving away that thing which is the most precious to us. Why does she do it? And how does she do it? And can we give away the thing that is most precious to us? We read on later in the story, Samuel goes on to become one of the most important leaders in Israel's history. He goes on to become probably the most important high priest. Samuel becomes the one who will recruit and anoint the first king of Israel, King Saul. So Samuel is the leader that develops Israel, brings them from being a tribal nation to a kingdom. And that wouldn't have been possible without Hannah giving away to the temple her very most precious thing. Just like in the birth stories of Isaac and Moses, there's a lot that we can learn about our faith by taking a close look at this story. And as we do, we will see parallels between Samuel's mother, Hannah, and Jesus' mother, Mary. And we'll see reflections of the gospel of Jesus Christ in this story. And so it begins in the first book of Samuel, the first chapter, and it says, Samuel's father's name was Elkanah. Now, biblical names, I've said this before, they have a lot of symbolic significance in these stories. And Elkanah means God has taken possession. So Elkanah is a God-possessed man, a righteous man. And it says Samuel's mother, her name is Hannah. And Hannah means she is gracious. So this scripture is saying that Samuel's parents were holy people, a family devoted to God. And the story says that Elkanah had two wives. Now that was not uncommon in ancient Israel. Elkanah's wives, we see, were in a bitter rivalry with each other. Penina, it says, had many children, but Hannah, her womb had been closed. She was unable to have children. And to make matters worse, Penina was cruel to her. She was taunting her, and she made Hannah feel terrible. In verse 3, it says that Elkanah and Penina and Hannah, they used to go up every year to the temple to sacrifice to God. And when they did that, Elkanah would give to his wives a portion so that they could enjoy the sacrifice. They could participate in the sacrifice. And it says he gave Penina a huge portion because she had so many children, so he gave her this big portion for the sacrifice. But interestingly, it says he gave Hannah an even larger portion. He gave her a double portion. Now these portions, they were important in the, in the ritual sacrifice of the temple because they believed at that time that your worth before God was directly related to the amount that you sacrificed. God's favor, they believed, was tied to the quality of your sacrifice. So Penina, she was probably insanely jealous that Hannah, she doesn't even have children. Why is she been, being given a double portion? And so Penina taunts Hannah. It says that she provokes her severely. She irritates her because the Lord has closed her womb. And this went on year after year. As often as Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, Penina would provoke her. Therefore, it says, Hannah wept and would not eat. So this is what's interesting to me. This is, I think, the first lesson for us in this story is that when we are in conflict with another person, in this case, Hannah's in conflict with both Penina and God, when we are in conflict, we cannot enjoy or recognize the blessings that God's given us. Hannah had been given a double portion. These blessings are piled before her, and she can't see them because she's in conflict. When we're in conflict with another person, that distracts us from everything else. You can't enjoy what you have when you're in conflict. You have to first reconcile with the person. It says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Reconcile. 
So listen to what Hannah does next. She's frustrated with God. So it says, Hannah presented herself before the Lord. That's the first step in the process of reconciliation. Whether it's we need to be reconciled with God or we need to be reconciled with another person, the first step in the process is to present yourself before the person. This can't happen over the phone. It can't happen over text. It has to happen in person. And then she makes a vow. She says, Lord of hosts, if you will only look at the misery of your servant. So she gives her pain over to God in prayer. And that's the second step in the process of reconciliation. We have to be willing to show our true vulnerable feelings when we go to be reconciled with someone. When we're angry, when we're in conflict with another person, we have to let that person know how we're feeling. It doesn't help when we bury our hurts or our feelings. I do this too sometimes. It doesn't help. You have to make your feelings known, your hurt feelings. You have to express them in a way that the other person can hear them. So in this case, I imagine she couldn't have that conversation with Panina because Panina was just being cruel to her, hateful to her. Panina didn't, didn't want to reconcile, but she could have that conversation with God. So listen to what she says. She says to God, Lord, I am a woman. I, I am deeply in pain, in deep misery. And as she's pouring herself out to God, Eli the priest notices her. Only he thinks she's drunk. He misunderstands her feelings. And that's the second thing that happens. Anytime we're in conflict, it's usually because there has been a misunderstanding. So that's sometimes why we're afraid to share our true feelings because there is this misunderstanding. We're not sure we're safe in that relationship. But again, you have to present yourself before the person, express your true feelings, correct the misunderstanding. And that's exactly what Hannah does. She talks to Eli and she says, no, that's a misunderstanding. I'm not drunk. I'm a woman full of sorrow. I've been pouring out my soul before the Lord. I've been speaking out of my great anxiety. And so she lets her anxiety show. She corrects the misunderstanding with Eli. That's what it takes for us to reconcile relationships to communicate those true vulnerable feelings. And in this case, the communication was successful because we see Eli says to her, go in peace. And may God give you what you've asked for in prayer. And then it says, Hannah's countenance was no longer sad. In other words, her sadness went away. How? By going through that process of reconciliation by going through the process of presenting her face to face with her adversary, then showing her true feelings vulnerably, then correcting the misunderstandings. And once that communication had successfully taken place, then she, it says, is when she felt relief, she felt happy. That's what it takes for us to get to the place of happiness in a tense relationship. But I know I make this mistake all the time. I think we all make this mistake of holding on to our, our anger, our hurt feelings. We don't want to risk more conflict, and so we just keep it to ourselves. Maybe we put on a smile, we paper over our real feelings, but that only leads to further division in the heart. It leads to resentment, and it leads to a distance in that strained relationship. And I think we make sometimes the same mistake in our relationship with God. We think that coming to worship God wants to see our, our joy. God wants to see um, our happiness, our praise as we come to God and worship. But we're not always full of joy. If we're honest, we also struggle and suffer. And so what this story is teaching us is we can be honest with God. We can bring our anguish to God. Our confession is as important as our praise. We can confess to God when we are depressed or unhappy even enraged, hopeless. God wants the whole of you. So Hannah's expressing her anguish to God, and the story goes on. Hannah and Elkanah, as soon as they leave the temple, they go back home, and they conceive, and Hannah gives birth to a son. And in verse 20, it says, She names her son Samuel, for she says, I have asked him for the Lord. I have asked the Lord for him. The name Samuel, it literally means... Named for God. 
And the story ends with Hannah fulfilling her vow. As soon as Samuel is weaned, she fulfills her vow. She brings Samuel to the temple, and she gives her baby over to the temple, the thing that she most wanted, the thing that is most precious to her. And so I was asking, as I was studying this, why does she do that? What's going on here? Christmas is the season of gift giving, but can you imagine giving that um, powerfully? I think Hannah was trying to be obedient to the laws of worship. She was literally giving from the first fruits of her womb. Listen to this. This is one of the worship laws from Exodus chapter 34, verse 19. It says, the first offspring of every womb belongs to me, says God, including the firstborn males of your livestock. That's part of what they believed about worship at the time. Exodus 23, 19 says, bring the best of your first fruits of the soil of your of your gardens to the house of the Lord your God. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 9 and 10 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all of your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will burst forth with new wine. So you see, I think Hannah was following the laws of worship. She was literally giving of the first fruits of her womb over to God. What is a first fruit? It is the most precious thing that you have in your life. I had a pretty measly tomato garden this past year, but when I got that first tomato, that was the first fruit. That was the most precious tomato of that crop, which was a pretty poor crop. <laughs> your first fruit is the most precious thing to you. It's the best thing that we have. What would it be like if we gave that over to God? What, if, what would it be like if we gave of our first fruits to God? And this is where the story of Samuel's birth connects to the story of Jesus' birth. Because Jesus is also referred to in Scripture, in the New Testament, as the first fruit of God. It says in 1 Corinthians 15 that Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first fruits of of those who fall asleep. Only here's the difference. In the story of Samuel's birth, we see an example of a faithful person, Hannah, giving over the first fruit of hers to God. But in the Christmas story, we see a faithful God giving his first fruits to us. In the story of Samuel, Hannah is sacrificing to God. But in the story of Christmas, God is sacrificing for us. Jesus is sacrificed to save us from our corruption. He's sacrificed to save us from our, our darkness and to bring us into light. So Hannah took what was most precious to her, and she gave it over to God. And that is another turning point in the story. As soon as she does that, she begins to praise God with everything that she has. There's a whole chapter 2 is the song of Hannah's praise. And as I look at that song of Hannah's praise, it's so similar to Mary's song of praise. After Mary had given everything over to God, she said, God, yes, take me, take my womb, take whatever you need for the birth of the Savior. That's when Mary begins to praise God. Listen to this. Hannah sings, my heart exalts in the Lord. My strength is exalted in my God. It sounds so much like Mary's song. Mary sings, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Hannah sings, the bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble gird on strength. She's, she's flipping power. Mary sings the same thing. She says, God has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. God has brought down the rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. Same idea. Hannah's song, she sings, those who are full have hired themselves out for laborers so they get bread. But those who are hungry are now fat with spoil. And Mary sings, God has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. So the point is, we can praise God fully and freely when we've given everything, our most precious thing, over to God. And if we read on in the book of 1 Samuel, we see how things turn out. God blessed Hannah with five more children. 
She gave obediently of her first fruits, and this abundant blessing came back to her. So how do we find that strength to do what Hannah did, to give the most precious thing that we have over to God? You know, I'm just, I'm just starting this journey of parenthood. And um, I can tell you that the thing that's the most precious to me by far more than anything else is my wife, Sarah, and my stepdaughter, Sonia, and our baby on the way, our growing family. That's the most precious thing to me. And I already can't understand how Hannah could have possibly given her baby over to the temple. I want the very best for Sarah and Sonia and our baby. But I'm learning that there's so much that's out of my control. I can't protect Sonia from mean words that other kids say to her in her classroom. That hurts. I also can't protect Sonia from the things that she reads in social media and sees on the internet. That's scary. There's so much that's influencing our children that is beyond our control. So I think for me, I have to do what Hannah did. I have to give my family over to God. I got several friends who've talked to me about how troubling it is when their children drift away from God. It's the most painful thing a parent can face. They went to Sunday school. They grew up in the church. They went to youth group. They were baptized and confirmed. They went on mission trips. They were part of the life of the church. We thought that they understood the importance and the power of Christ in their lives, the importance of the gospel. And so it's painful to see your children disconnect from any kind of faith in God. One of my friends is a pastor, and he has two sons, and both of his sons have want nothing to do with the church, and it just gives him so much pain. It breaks his heart to see his adult children exhibiting values that are not the values that he and his wife taught them. And I'm just starting out on this journey. I need your advice as expert parents. <laughs> Maybe you don't think you're expert. Yeah. You're more expert than I am. And it's not your fault as parents if you're, if you're facing this. There's so much that influences children beyond our control. But I found this prayer this week for parents, and it says, Lord, it's so hard to let my children go, to life, to suffering, to you. It's so hard to leave them alone, to work out their own problems. Help me, Lord, to trust you more, to interfere less. I give my children over to you, Lord. Bend, bend down to them, take care of them. Give them good things. In the name of Jesus, your perfect gift to the world. Amen. What is most precious to you? What is it that you can't conceive of giving up? Maybe it's control of a certain situation that you really want to see the outcome of. Maybe that's the most precious thing to you. Can you give it over to God? Maybe it's your health. Can you give that over to God? Maybe it's your desire to be financially secure. Can you give that over to God? God has already given everything that matters over to us. God has given to us from his firstborn, the first fruits. He's given us a mighty counselor, a wonderful savior, an everlasting father, a prince of peace. So you know, every one of these birth stories that we've been studying through over the past three weeks begins in barrenness. Sarah was barren before she gave birth to Isaac. Hannah was barren before she gave birth to Samuel. Samson's mother was barren. Moses' mother was not barren but gave birth in the hopelessness of a genocide. And Jesus is born into a barren hopelessness of Israel's oppression under the tyranny of a corrupt king and their occupation under the Romans. That is where every one of these birth stories begins in utter hopelessness, barrenness. And that is where our story begins. But there's something about to be birthed for us and in us. My prayer is that at the birth of Jesus, that this Christmas Jesus would be born again in you, within you. 
And every one of these figures that's born in these stories goes on to become a savior of Israel in one way or another. Salvation is born of barrenness. Let us pray. God, we take a moment right now to think about what is more precious to us than anything else. Is it our families? Is it our children? Is it our grandchildren? Is it our health? Whatever it is, God, in our minds right now and with our hearts, we give you that which is most precious to us. We give it over to you right now. We release that into your care. God, take what we are giving to you right now and raise it up like you raised Samuel up for a greater purpose. We give you, God, from our first fruits just as you've given us from your first fruits. And help us to receive what you've given us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The hymn is Hark the Glad Sound. been praying for with anguish? What have you been going to God for on your knees and asking God for? Take that very thing and give it over to God and listen as God says, go in peace and may God grant you, the God of Israel grant you what you've asked for. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace now and forever. Amen.